السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين We praise Allah سبحانه وتعالى We thank him upon all conditions We send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم His household, his companions May Allah bless them all and may Allah bless every one of us And grant us goodness and ease in this world as well as the next Amin. My brothers and sisters, as we heard the Prophet wasallam in the last year, the final pilgrimage that he had undertaken, he addressed his companions in a unique way. And a lot of what he said even prior to what was known as the farewell sermon was looked at from a different angle because of its importance when someone tells you you know i may not be here next year i may not be in your midst next year and they live in your community they live amongst you you would get a little bit worried from amongst us it wouldn't even be correct for any one of us to say that because we don't know. But the messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the wording they used was definitely not just from their own whims and fancies, nay, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As Allah says, وَمَا يَنطِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا يُوحَىٰ Indeed, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam never uttered from his own desires or whims and fancies astaghfirullah rather whatever he said was revelation revealed and for your information two types of revelation one the word of allah which is to be conveyed to others in its wording because it was said by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the words of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is the quran and the rest of it Besides the Quran is known as the Sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or the Hadith. The statements that he uttered, the wording was his. The message was from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So on the day of Arafah, and you and I know that is the Hajj. That is the most important day of Hajj. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on this mount, the mount known as Rahmah, I'm sure many of us who've been there have seen it and even those who have not been there perhaps in a lot of the videos and the photographs that we've seen I'm sure we know exactly what we're talking about currently they have placed a white pillar on this mountain so the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam addressed his companions from there there is a narration that makes mention of Earlier, the fact that Adam alayhi salam and Hawa, Eve may peace be upon her, they say in a narration mentioned by Ibn Kathir rahmatullahi alayhi, that they met after they were sent onto the earth at that spot. So it's known as Arafah and it's known as Rahmah. And this is why the city around the corner is known as Jiddah, also referring to Jeddah. It means the grandmother. But what is interesting is when the Prophet ﷺ got up, firstly, and you know when he commenced and when, whenever he spoke, he commenced in a way praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he used to say, مَن يُضْلِلِ اللَّهُ فَلَا هَادِيَ لَهُ مَن يَهْدِهِ اللَّهُ فَلَا مُضِلَّ لَهُ These two statements are very, very interesting. Because you and I can search for the truth. But I promise you, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has written for us what is known as tawfiq. Tawfiq meaning if Allah has written the goodness for us that we will be able to benefit from it, then we will benefit. But if Allah has written against us ignorance, against our names, no matter how much we look at things, we won't see the light. And this is why the first surah of the Quran, Surah Al-Fatiha, we repeat it thousands of times. In it, there is only one dua. There is only one supplication. There is nothing beyond that. The rest of it is filled with praise and declaration. That's what it is. If you look at Surah Al-Fatiha, it starts off with praise. 
And if you look at the declaration that is immediately after that, declaring that Allah is the, the, the king or the owner of the day of judgment. And then we ask after that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for one thing. And the, the entire surah is repeated in every unit of prayer, such that your prayer is invalid if you have not said the surah. What is it? Guide us to the straight path. Guide us to the straight path. This is why immediately after that, there is only a description of that path. Before it, there is praise of Allah, there is a declaration. Then there is a prayer, a dua, supplication. And after that, there is a detail of that particular supplication. That's it. The path. The path I'm asking for is not the path of those who have earned your anger or those who have gone astray. It is the path of those whom you have favored. In other words, favor me too. And I keep on repeating the same dua to Allah so many times a day. This goes to show us that when we want something, we should repeat the prayer to Allah. We should ask Allah again and again for the same thing. No problem. May Allah open our doors. So if we take a look at this statement, He who is guided by Allah, nobody can misguide that person. And he who is misguided, none besides Allah can actually guide that person. Subhanallah. So if Allah has written misguidance, they look, look at the people. If we were to bring Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam here to address you in front of you, and he were to say what he has already declared and what is already enshrined, would we listen? That's a question. Very powerful question. Would we actually listen? People would get excited. Oh, wow. Do you know who that is? We get excited about a scholar who is really not even a prophet, fallible person, someone who is a normal human being like us, exactly like us. We get excited to see them because maybe we've benefited from them. Maybe we have learned a thing or two from them. Imagine if Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came here and addressed us. Would we actually change? Would we actually listen? The answer is only Allah knows. Why? Because at the time of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he addressed the people and a lot of them initially did not even bother. They wanted to harm him as a result of him being upright. Just because he was upright, they wanted to harm him. No drinking, they want to harm him. No womanizing, they want to harm him. No cheating, stealing, they want to harm him. Justice, they want to harm him. Something strange that really woke me up when I read it later on in my life. When we read it initially, we just read past it and continued was when revelation first came to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his wife Khadija bint Khuwaylid radiallahu anha took him to Waraqa ibn Nawfal, her relative. And this man had a lot of knowledge based on revelation, the previous scriptures. He asked a few questions and then he says, I wish I will be there the day that your people drive you out. Subhanallah, drive you out? Why would they drive me out? Because that's what they've done to everyone who was sent by Allah. They drove them out. So to be driven out and to be told that you're a, perhaps after something else, something material such as maybe authority, maybe wealth, maybe women and so on. That has happened to the prophets of Allah. Who are we that it won't happen to us? When you are upright, when you try to please Allah, people will laugh at you. They will call you names. They will make it difficult. That's a sign you're on the right path. No problem. But it's a path of softness. It's a path of courtesy. It's a path of politeness. Although it is a straight path that can be seen. It is loud and clear. As clear as the sun. So the Prophet ﷺ was told by Waraka when he was young, still just he just received Nubuwa and he was told, your people will drive you out. I wish I was there on that day. And he was like, how? Why would they drive me out? Subhanallah. 
So going back to this statement of his where he says, whoever Allah guides, no one can misguide. My brothers and sisters keep asking Allah for guidance. Search for it, look for it. Make sure that you listen attentively. Make sure that you understand what is happening. Subhanallah. So then he says after that, after the first few words that he uttered, in this beautiful sermon that he delivered on this occasion, he says, He says, Chances are that you will not see me after this year of ours. After this year, you won't see me. The companions understood that this means perhaps Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take him away. They understood it. Now there, there are emotions. Now the people are listening. Now there are tears. Now they want to know what is this major massive statement that is about to be uttered by the greatest of those to tread this earth. So he continues encouraging his companions to be conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm sure whenever you hear the Jumu'ah, the lecture, what is known as the khutbah, the Imam, he starts off by saying, Amma ba'du, fattaqu Allah ibad Allah. I'm sure you've heard that, right? Amma ba'd, fattaqu Allah ibad Allah. Oh, ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, attaqu Allah. O oh, you who believe, be conscious of Allah. Be mindful of your duties unto Allah. Be mindful of your duties unto Allah. This is revelation from the heavens. This is the best of creation saying this. There were people who heard it. Abu Jahl heard it. So many others heard it. Heard what? Heard the messenger, peace be upon him, call them personally towards goodness and Islam, but they rejected it. They did not listen. Imagine someone personally being called by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Personally. Imagine a letter comes to you from Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Personally. And you reject it. Kisra tore it and threw it away. That was the Persian king. So when we hear the term taqwa Allah, be mindful. Those were the same words uttered by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And those words definitely should be thought of every single day. Am I conscious of my maker? Am I conscious of the fact that I'm going to go back to him maybe today? I might be going back to him. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with us the day he takes us away. So he starts off by saying, and these words are mentioned in several narrations. I've just brought them all together. He starts off by saying, Inna dima'akum wa a'radakum haramun alaykum kahurmati yawmikum hadha fi shahrikum hadha fi baladikum hadha. He asks a question first. He says, do you know what day this is? And this happened more than once. It happened that day and the next day, two days. So this was all known as the farewell sermon. The one, the main one was delivered in Arafah on the day of Arafah. But on the day of Nahar, he repeated similar points again. And this is why sometimes when we hear it, the Prophet ﷺ said on the day of Nahar, do you know what day this is? They said, yes, it's a blessed day. This is the day. He says, do you know what month this is? The companions were thinking, the way he's asking us, it seems like he's going to give it a different name. Is this not the blessed month, the sacred month? Do you know what city we're in? So they thought maybe he's going to give it a different name. Is this not a blessed city, the city of Mecca? After asking all these questions, he says, I want you to know that your blood is sacred. Your wealth is sacred. You're not allowed to kill. You're not allowed to kill because your blood is sacred. You're not allowed to steal and pinch, deceive people regarding their wealth because your wealth is sacred. Sacred meaning you are entitled to its ownership just like others. You cannot usurp it. 
يا أيها الذين آمنوا لا تأكلوا أموالكم بينكم بالباطل إلا أن تكون تجارة عن تراض منكم ولا تقتلوا أنفسكم إن الله كان بكم رحيما الله says oh you who believe do not consume the wealth of one another unjustly unless it is obviously a business deal that both parties are satisfied with so you're not allowed to consume the wealth of one another so he says your blood is haram meaning the murder your wealth is haram meaning stealing or deceiving in any way and your dignity you know when a person talks about you they accuse you they say things they utter words and they don't even think about it and they have messed your reputation they have messed with your dignity and they have uttered words that have defamed you the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says that is haram that would add on to it issues such as adultery fornication immorality sexual misconduct it's all included in this. Subhanallah. Imagine a person, one might say, how is that included in it? Because if a person were to commit a crime, if that was to be known, and even if it were not to be known, you committed adultery, you had a relationship with someone whom you're not supposed to be having the relationship with. In essence, you've insulted yourself and them, and you've spoiled your reputation and theirs. Imagine if that were to be known by the world. Imagine if that were to be spread on the papers or in the news. What would happen? It would be embarrassing. So you have harmed someone. But Allah knows. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive our shortcomings. So that is haram. In the same way that this day is haram. This city is haram. Subhanallah. Kahurmati yawmikum hadha. Fi shahrikum hadha. Fi baladikum hadha. The same way that this day is haram, this month is haram, and the city is haram. The city of Makkah is haram. Do you know what that means? That means the sanctity of it is intact and very broad based. You're not allowed to harm animals or insects, or you're not allowed to destroy the trees. You're not allowed to actually uh, perpetrate crime in it at all. Not at all. No excuse. The city of Makkah. And there are four months in the year whereby... There are four months in the year whereby fighting is not allowed at all. Even legitimate warfare, you cannot commence it. You may defend yourself, but you cannot commence it. And one of those months is Dhul Hijjah. So the Prophet ﷺ says, totally haram. We're not allowed. You're not allowed. And he says something very interesting in this beautiful khutbah of his. He made it a duty upon all those who were present to inform those who are not present. He says, those who are present, inform those who are not present. Which means it's the duty of all of us to continue conveying that beautiful message. Today people find it cheap, kill one another, slaughter, accuse, commit this sin, talk bad about that one, steal, pinch, eat that which is disallowed, call it whatever you want. So the Prophet ﷺ thereafter speaks about the issue of interest and riba. And he says, it is prohibited. What used to happen in the period of ignorance where people used to charge is prohibited. We don't do that. Business dealings need to be upright in essence. I'm obviously translating it from the Arabic and explaining it. It's important for us to realize that this issue was addressed. The issue of being just when it comes to dealing and making sure that yes, you earn. You definitely earn 
but you earn in a pure way and in a good way. And the Prophet wasallam went on to make it clear that any form of disturbance of the peace, security of the individuals is actually prohibited. You don't disturb the peace. You don't disturb a person's security. You don't threaten people. And you have to move on. You have to understand something very interesting. You see, if one person fights another, that person may fight them back. And maybe that person's family might want to come and fight this person. So this person's family gets involved. And then that person's tribe gets involved. And then this person's tribe gets involved. And then that person's nation gets involved. And then this person's nation gets involved. And it becomes bigger and bigger until for something very, very small, two massive nations are at war. So you need to look into this. Before you do something, think of the reaction. Think of what will happen. It's important for us to know this. Before you do something, think of the reaction as a Muslim. Don't just do things without thinking of what the repercussion shall be. There may be a repercussion. And if that repercussion is bigger than what you want to achieve, you may want to hold on. Or if it is something wrong that you want to do, don't, not at all. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us. The Prophet ﷺ then speaks about women and he addresses the matter in a very deep way. He speaks about the rights of the women and he tells the men to be careful regarding their treatment of women. Strangely, he did not tell the women to be careful about their relationship or the way they treat the men. But what is meant here is to take care of those who, whom you are supposed to be taking care of. To provide them with what you are supposed to be providing them with. The men are responsible, women are responsible too. And this is why he says at the beginning of the statement regarding women, he says, you should know that there are rights you need to fulfill regarding the women. And there are rights the women need to fulfill regarding you. Imagine a declaration telling us what to do. And he says, be calm. When it comes to your relationship with women, I advise you goodness regarding women. Be good, be kind. Wallahi, if we can pause there for a moment, many of us, and I've said this in my earlier speech, Many of us, when we speak to our own women who are living with us, we speak in a way that if we were to replay a video, had it been recorded, we would be embarrassed for it to be shown in front of us to others. That's how we speak. There was once a couple that came to me complaining about the situation in their house with those whom they live with. And I made a suggestion in passing that I was not serious about. I just said, I think you guys need CCTV to prove what's going on, you know. They actually installed CCTV in the kitchen <laughs> and in the common areas of the home in order to nab. I don't even want to say who, because earlier I called them the in-loves, didn't I? But in order to nab family members, look how he, she is talking to my wife. Look at how he is talking to her or things of that nature or the treatment. I promise you, I laughed when that happened. And I said, I didn't mean it literally. I was only saying it. But it solved the problem. Because now you know, hey, there's a CCTV there. I better just say, oh, how are you? Everything's okay. I hope you're fine. And you, you know, I, I don't know if... <laughs> If you've seen on YouTube a few people who've pinched, they've stolen, there are clips like this that show you CCTVs where a person steals, they're caught, and they realize, oh, there's a camera, so they quickly give it back. 
it's happened. You can see it. It's interesting, very interesting. I actually saw one where the, a, a guy in India was caught and he had just taken a wallet from someone's pocket. And a little while later, he put the wallet he, on the floor and he tapped the man's shoulder and he said, your wallet's on the floor. Then he looked at the camera and he did this. <laughs> he said, I don't want to be nabbed. And I'm thinking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has something more accurate than that CCTV regarding all of us. We can delete what is on that recording by seeking forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Definitely. We can delete it by seeking forgiveness. But we cannot die in the condition where when it's replayed for us, we will be embarrassed. We won't have any denial because you know what? It is so true. So the Prophet ﷺ warns us about our relationships with women, with our women, our daughters, our sisters, our wives, our mothers, those who are related to us, the women folk, even those who are not related to us, how we treat them. Many times people use culture in order to oppress women without realizing that from the angle and perspective of revelation that Allah had revealed, it would not even be in that way. And I'm sure you know a few examples in every society and community. There are different examples. People like to use religion where it suits them and where they can say, Look, I'm the man. Like I told you this morning, when a person visits the sick and he says, I'm here at two in the morning because I know that visiting the sick is a merit and I want the reward of visiting the sick. And if the other person is intelligent, they'll read a verse of the Quran where Allah says, if you are told to go back, you go back. It's better for you. Subhanallah. My brothers and sisters, the same applies here. We use a verse of the Quran. We use a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ in order to suit us, in order to use it against someone for something we would like. But when it is against us, we run away like a mouse. We're gone. What happened? There was a verse being recited. I ran away. Let's not let that happen. So the Prophet ﷺ speaks about the women in this way. Then he says something again regarding murder. Again. He says, لا ترجعوا بعدي كفارا يضرب بعضكم رقاب بعض. Imagine it's like a prophecy. It's like he knew. It's like a prophecy. He says, do not become kuffar after me by killing one another. What that means is, do not kill one another. You as an ummah, do not kill one another. And by killing one another, you would lose faith. That's what is meant. That's why he says, don't return to kufr after me by killing one another. It's very important for us to realize we will have differences amongst us. We will have differences amongst us. My brothers and sisters, never does it justify that we kill someone because they differ with us. That is a message that needs to be driven home. Because today we are facing that. The biggest enemies of the Muslims are the Muslims themselves. Because amongst us, those who utter the shahada, those who call themselves the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, there are people who have taken it upon themselves to remove others from the fold of Islam and say that now that they are no longer in the fold of Islam, it is permissible for anyone to get up and start killing and harming. That is totally unacceptable, my brothers and sisters. Totally unacceptable. Even if we disagree with each other, there is no way that killing each other is justified. And the Prophet ﷺ in this farewell sermon, go and read all the narrations. You will find this particular point there. You'll find it there. Subhanallah. So I, I really encourage all those who will hear this message. To live in harmony with one another. To understand life is too short. It is your challenge. You need to make sure that you do whatever is in your capacity. 
to ensure harmony, goodness, peace, stability, security. This is what it is. And you will differ. That's why the whole of da'wah, you know the word da'wah? The word da'wah is not only the title of a beautiful bookstore in Malaysia and elsewhere. No. <laughs> Beyond that, it is to call towards goodness. If everyone was expected to be on the goodness, how would we call? We wouldn't be able to call. If everyone was praying salah five times a day, everyone, would there be any point to get up on any platform and say, my people, please pray five times a day? No, because we're already praying. They would say, talk about something else. Have you ever heard someone get up on a stage and say, brothers and sisters, I plead with you to breathe. I plead with you to breathe. Please breathe. Have you heard that? No, because everyone is breathing. But they will definitely tell you perhaps how to breathe maybe. To say, you know what? Don't just breathe in and out from your mouth in a shallow way. There is a way to breathe. That's not my topic anyway. But the point I'm raising is we will have differences so that we can discuss them, so that we can convey a message. There will be people who don't pray so that those who perhaps do can encourage them in a beautiful way and see, you know, my sister, mashallah, you have so many points of goodness in you. You're such a lovely person. Alhamdulillah, you, you are so, I've taken so much from you. But there is one small point that I want to remind you of. That's also quite direct, but you may be in a polite way. And then you can say, you know, I know it's not so easy to get up to pray. And sometimes, you know, when you have makeup on, it's not so easy to actually wash off and make wudu. And it's not so easy to actually turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because you've already just spent 300 ringgates on your face. And you know, the time of salah is expiring and so on. What am I doing? I'm speaking. I'm saying things. Why? Because it's a crisis. It's a problem. That's what it is. It's a problem. So we encourage each other because there is an issue. That's an act of worship. Allah blessed us by making people not do certain things in a way that it gives us the opportunity to encourage them to do the good things. That's a gift. Have you ever looked at it that way? When you see someone astray, for you, it's an opportunity of earning reward by trying to convince them in the best possible way. Because if you're going to go up to them and swear them, they're not going to listen to you. If you're going to be harsh, Allah says it to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, It is by the mercy of Allah that you are lenient towards them. Your nature is very lenient. That's the nature of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Allah says, "It is by the, it is by the mercy of Allah that you are lenient towards them. If you were hard-hearted and harsh, they would have dispersed from around you." Same applies to us. When you are hard-hearted and harsh with anyone, they will not like to even listen to you. They won't want to talk to you or look at you. They won't want to be in your company. They won't, because you are hard-hearted and harsh. So when you see someone doing something wrong, don't just say, right, that man is a kafir, I need to kill him. That's what's happening today. Wallahi. That is exactly what is happening today. But when you see someone doing wrong, a true believer understands what the Prophet, peace be upon him, has said. And a true believer seizes the opportunity to come in a beautiful way, the best possible words, to try and encourage them. And they would be so happy to see this person come onto the right side or come and do the right thing at least. Bearing in mind that every one of us needs attention, myself included, we need attention. All of us. I cannot stand up on this podium and preach as though I'm the Holy One and everyone else. That's it. No. I need it just as much as you do. And I need to repeat it and reiterate this because there's no prophethood. Prophethood was completed with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I need help. If you see me do something wrong, indeed it's your duty 
it's your duty to correct me even if it means through a little dua if you didn't have the courage to come to me and to tell me through a little dua oh Allah guide him and when you say guide him don't think that I'm the one who's guided completely guide him and keep me guided or guide him and guide me too or even if you say guide him the angels are saying and guide him too so it's something beautiful so this was the message of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he spoke about not killing one another. And then he says, you know, Shaytan, Shaytan, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is saying this in the final sermon. He says, Shaytan has lost hope regarding extinguishing your faith. There's an emergency. I'm so sorry. There's an emergency. Okay. So going back to what I was saying, the Prophet ﷺ made this clear right at the end and he instructed us, he told us not to return to kufr by killing one another. And this is why I said, when we see someone doing something wrong, we look at it as an opportunity to gain closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by correcting them, what is known as da'wah, inviting them towards goodness. Had it not been for that, how would we have been engaging in da'wah or in calling people towards what was right if everyone was right? And this is why Allah has created us in a way that we would be able to get closeness to Him by encouraging one another to do good, by continuing to remind one another regarding what the goodness is. So even the one who is reminding, he would need a reminder. Like I said earlier, it doesn't mean that I am standing in front of you, I'm the holy one and everyone else has holes. No. What it does mean is I am just like you, I'm reminding you and I need the reminder before it actually gets to you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all steadfastness and make it easy for every one of us. In that final khutbah, the Prophet ﷺ also spoke about inheritance and the issue of inheritance. Do you know, prior to the advent of the Prophet ﷺ, there was a period known as the period of ignorance, al jahiliya And at that, during that period, women were considered as commodities. They were treated subhuman they were bought and sold they were given they were made to do things that were unacceptable islam came in to give honor to the woman such that even though all her needs are taken care of all her needs are taken care of by the closest male relative in islam she will still be given a token amount a token amount of inheritance when someone close to her in relation passes away. One might say, well, it was not necessary for her to get because you know, the man provides her with her food, clothing and accommodation and necessities. And that's the duty of the men. Although some men run away from it today. But this is an acknowledgement of the status of a woman. And this is why Islam says, and the Prophet ﷺ reiterated it during this final sermon, that a woman will be given her share. Everyone who is owed a share by the Quran, meaning by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, will be given that share, not more, not less. So what that means is, I cannot come up and say, you know, I've got three daughters, and this one is my favorite, and these two, they're okay, that one didn't even listen to me, she got married to someone I didn't even like. So you get double, you get half, and you get nothing. You cannot do that. It's haram, it's prohibited. It's a major sin. It may, if you consider it permissible, knowingly, it may even make you a person who's not really considered a surrenderer. And what is a surrenderer? A Muslim who surrenders. You may have treaded some dangerous path. So it's important for us to realize when the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala has stipulated something, who are we to question it? If we call ourselves Muslim, 
And this is why on a global level, people say, you know, this is not right with Islam. That's not right with Islam. That's not right with Islam. When people say it as non-Muslim, they don't believe. They don't believe. It's easier to digest what they are saying because you know they don't even believe. They don't even realize. But what hurts and what is unacceptable is when someone calling themselves Muslim and they claim to surrender to Islam and then they start picking and choosing and saying, I'm a Muslim, but, and I'm a follower of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but when he said this and this, I disagree with this. When, when this is in the Quran and that is in the Quran, I disagree with these few things. I think it is injustice. Well, why call yourself someone who surrenders when you have not really surrendered? We need to go back and visit this. Everything that Allah has revealed and everything that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam confirmed to have uttered, we can never pick on it. Because a true believer is the one who surrenders to it. Listen to the verse, Surah Al-Ahzab. وَمَا كَانَ لِمُؤْمِنٍ وَلَا مُؤْمِنَةٍ إِذَا قَضَى اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ أَمْرًا أَنْ يَكُونَ لَهُمُ الْخِيَارَةُ مِنْ أَمْرِهِمْ وَمَنْ يَعْصِ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ فَقَدْ ضَلَّ ضَلَالًا بَعِيدًا It is not for a believing male or female that when Allah and His Messenger have declared something, that they feel they have a choice in that regard. It is not for them. Subhanallah. If you are believing male or female, when Allah and His Messenger have declared something, you don't feel that you have a choice in that regard because you know that's it. You might be weak. You might not have been able to fulfill something out of your weakness, but you cannot declare that that is wrong. Because if you declare it is wrong, what you've done is you've chosen a different path. And this is what is being uttered by Muhammad ﷺ. He says, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decided that a person will get X amount of a share, then la wasiyyata li waridin. You cannot bequeath an excess amount for a person whom Allah has told you the equation, the fraction that they will receive. So when Allah says the mother will get a sixth or the mother will get a third in this condition, the wife will get a quarter or an eighth, the husband will get half or a quarter. In this condition and that condition, you cannot say, okay, you are a very loving wife, I'm going to add a little bit more for you. No, in your life, whatever you gave, you gave. I'm allowed to give in my life whatever I'd like. I can give anyone. I can pick on a person who perhaps is not even related to me and give them whatever I want. When it comes to death and con the connection to death, I cannot say when I die, then this will go to X, Y, and Z unless they are not related to me or they are not receiving the fixed share from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the total of that bequest does not exceed a third, one third. So this is explained even in this particular khutbah. And like I say, one of the reasons is people cheat a lot when it comes to inheritance. I know being a person who helps people after the death of a close relative, to fulfill the or to execute the wills, I see a lot happening, a lot. And sometimes the women who don't really know much about buildings and property and about different types of business, etc., they are cheated. The value of this, undervalued. You know, you go to a woman, an elderly woman, and she's supposed to get, for example, one sixth of a certain property. And you go and you know the property is worth 20 million and you say, you know, mom, that property is worth one million dollars. She goes, oh, one million. Yes, you are going to get one sixth of that. And she says, Alhamdulillah. And you know you've lied. It's 20 million. Subhanallah. Let's never do that. I promise you one dirham that you eat, which is haram, is worse for you than the whole world and whatever is in it. We should never do this, my brothers and sisters. So the Prophet ﷺ continues and he makes mention of so many factors on that particular day. I want to draw your attention to a specific surah of the Quran that has in it also the rights, the, the, the beautiful rights of one another, the declaration of how to live. 
Two things if we look at, we will be able to improve our lives immediately. One, the details of the farewell sermon, and I've gone into quite a few of the details. But two, is a surah in the Quran known as Surah Al-Hujurat. Al-Hujurat, the rooms. If you pick up the Quran and you read Surah Al-Hujurat, it's very simple to understand. Similar points are made mention of when two, when two people are fighting among the mu'mineen, make peace. Solve the matter between them. If you cannot solve the matter, then collectively you need to fight the one who is wrong. The one who doesn't want to resolve the matter. Until he or she comes back to what Allah has declared. So my brothers and sisters, let's realize that these rules and regulations have been made mention of by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, not only so that we can just look at it and say, wow, these are good rules. Oh, lovely, nice. And we're leading our lives in a totally different way. But rather we look at these rules and regulations. Like I said, Surah Al-Hujurat speaks about how to, how to address each other, the type of names we give each other, what is wrong and why is it wrong? Why should we not backbite and perpetrate sins and crimes? Some of these crimes are mentioned in the surah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, would you like it for yourself? No, you wouldn't. Would you like something evil for yourself? Go into the details of the surah and see. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all goodness and ease. Uh, we pray for the sister there, inshallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for her. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant her cure. I still have two or three minutes remaining, but inshallah I will close. We've been distracted uh, quite a bit, but that was all in, in good faith inshallah. And uh, I pray that Allah accept from us whatever we have delivered today. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep us on the straight path and to make us from among those whom when we read Surah Al-Fatiha every single day, when we read Surah Al-Fatiha every single day, in every single unit of our prayers, we understand that in it, there is one prayer, one supplication, and that is, إِهْدِنَ الصِّرَاطَ mustaqim. Guide us to the straight path. So we don't just want to say the statement without thinking about it. Why is it so important? Why is the straight path so important that we have to repeat the seeking from Allah of being on the straight path so many times a day? There definitely is a reason. Because it is only when we tread the straight path that we will be able to save ourselves. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all Jannah al Firdaus Aqulu Kawli Hada wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.